NASA tests out a snakebot that could explore difficult terrain an independent way to measure the expansion of the universe, and JUICE successfully deploys its radar antenna. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. All right, first up, we've got some good news, and that is that the European Space Agency's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer mission, JUICE, has successfully deployed its radar antenna. And I know you were worried about this. I was worried about this. Would it go all the way to Jupiter, all the way to Callisto, Europa, Ganymede, and not have this radar antenna that it would then use to explore under the ice on these moons of Jupiter to figure out where the oceans start. Are there any pockets of water closer to the surface? How does the geyser activity work? Like this was a big key to the entire mission. And the good news is the antenna has deployed. The antenna is 60 meters long, and so it couldn't be launched fully extended. It had to be folded up. And then when it got into space, it would deploy the antenna, folding it out over a bunch of movements. And the problem is, is that a pin designed to hold the antenna in didn't fully extract. And so it was trapped. And mission controllers at ESA tried a bunch of ideas. The first one was to jiggle the spacecraft. They essentially fired its thrusters a few times, to try and see if that would knock the pin loose and get it to extend. It didn't work. Then they turned the spacecraft to put it into direct sunlight and the hope was that just the heating metal would change the shape and size of things enough for the antenna to deploy. That didn't work. Next, they fired a mechanical actuator. This is a part of the equipment designed to extend the antenna and they banged it in the spacecraft and that sent vibrations along the metal where this, this pin was and that caused it just to move just a couple of millimeters, which was enough for the antenna to get out and the full antenna extended. So now antenna extended, ESA's JUICE mission is ready to do science in 2031. A warning before a solar storm disaster. I've talked about this several times here on the channel that of all the existential threats that I think humanity faces from space, the one that most concerns me are solar storms. These are very powerful flares that can blast off the sun, sending a huge storm of charged particles towards the Earth. These can interfere with satellites, with electrical grids, cause power outages. We saw in Quebec a few decades ago that power outages could be caused by a solar storm. And of course, there's the famous Carrington event back in the 1800s that was so powerful that it lit telegraph poles on fire. So we know solar storms have the potential to be dangerous. There's not a great correlation between a very powerful flare and then the solar storm particles that arrive here on Earth. But now astronomers have developed a machine learning algorithm that is able to watch the sun detect a flare and then predict how bad the solar storm is going to be when it reaches Earth because you get the flare part which travels at the speed of light, but then the charged particles can take a few minutes to a few hours to arrive later on. And so you can know when and where the solar storm is going to affect the Earth. And like, maybe you get 30 minutes of notice that there's going to be a dangerous solar storm. And that doesn't sound like very much time, but actually it's plenty of time. It's time to say disconnect parts of your power grid, time to safely shut down electronics, wait for the solar storm to go by. Also, solar storms really only affect regions of planet Earth. Of course, you've got the day side and the night side. And so the night side is completely safe from a solar storm. You only have to worry about the day side, but also where the solar storm hits Earth can be very regional. And so now astronomers are able to not only predict if a solar storm is going to be powerful and dangerous, but also where on Earth we could see the greatest results. And that would give people in those areas time to make their equipment more safe so they can recover after the solar storm wraps up. And if you want to know more, I did a pretty fascinating interview with Dr. Benjamin Pope, who has examined solar storms that have happened historically. And some of them are way off the charts that make the Carrington event seem fairly minor. Finally, an explanation for ultra luminous bursts. There are very bright explosions in the universe. Think about supernovae, kilonovae, quasars. 
But there's one class of objects that astronomers have been very puzzled by, and these are known as ultra luminous bursts. And the problem is that they break the Eddington limit. And this is essentially a mathematical prediction for based on the amount of mass that's involved in an explosion like a supernova, and the amount of energy that's released, there's like a limit to just how powerful one of these explosions can be. And yet astronomers have found explosions that break the Eddington limit. And the question is like, what's going on? Is there some mistake in the observations to either measure like the, the size of the object, the mass of the object, or the amount of energy that's being released? And new research says no, in fact, these limit breaking bursts are happening, even though they do break the Eddington limit. The discovery was made with a neutron star this is one of these dead stars that happen after a star more massive than the sun explodes as a supernova when they first form, they often have a lot of leftover momentum, they're spinning very rapidly, sometimes hundreds of times a minute. And they can have these really intense magnetic fields that wrap around them and interact with material in their surroundings. And so in the case of one of these objects, they found that you have this pulsar with these intense magnetic fields that is siphoning material from a companion object, because the magnetic fields are able to shape and distort this material around the pulsar, it's able to emit more powerful explosions than astronomers would have predicted purely by the mass of the neutron star on its own. So it turns out if the physics are right, you can get extra powerful explosions in the universe. NASA tests a snake like rover. Think about all of the rovers that we've seen so far exploring the solar system. They've got wheels, they're able to go across sand, very smooth regions, you know, maybe the occasional hill crawl carefully into a crater, maneuver around some boulders. But when you think about the kind of terrain across the solar system, very little of it is perfectly flat and free of boulders. And a lot of the most interesting places, like the ancient river leading into or out of a crater or some kind of cliff that has evidence of mineral striations in it or imagine an ice field on Europa or Enceladus like you need something that is more capable than a rover with wheels that's just going to fall over sideways into a small crevice if it runs across the wrong terrain. So NASA has been testing out this idea of a snake robot. I mean, its actual official name is called the Exobiology Extant Life Surveyor or EELS. Oh, another backronym. But it really looks like a snake and it moves like a snake across varied terrain. And so it can slither, it can climb, it can move around boulders and up fairly steep slopes or down slopes. And when you think about some of the places that this could work, you can imagine it being able to crawl down into a lava tube on Mars or around a region of a geyser on Enceladus or Europa. NASA has equipped this rover, although rover's not really the right crawler, snake bot, slitherer. NASA has equipped this slitherer with a series of instruments. It's got multiple cameras. It's also got a LIDAR so that it can map the terrain around itself and be able to autonomously choose pathways around the various obstacles. And when you think about like, if you're going to send a mission out to Enceladus, you're looking at like an hour and a half return journey for any commands that go to and from the rover. If it's right up against the edge of a crevasse, you're not going to wait an hour and a half to have it navigate more carefully around the area, it's got to be able to make those decisions on its own. So engineers from NASA tested out the eel system at a glacier in Canadian Rockies Park, and they're able to find that it's able to move around in the kind of terrain that you would expect to see in a place like Enceladus, a snake like robot exploring the geysers on Enceladus. Yes, please. A successful test for Raptor version three. We saw the successful or unsuccessful test of the super heavy starship stack a few weeks ago, and those were equipped with the Raptor two engines. The super heavy booster has 33 Raptor V two engines, and the starship has six of them. And these are an iteration on the earlier Raptor V one engine. And now we got a tweet from Elon Musk saying that they have tested the version three of the Raptor engine and the amount of thrust is pretty amazing. According to Elon Musk, 
he said it got 350 bar chamber pressure with 269 tons of thrust. Just for comparison, the Raptor 2 does 230 tons of thrust, and the original Raptor 1 did 185 tons of thrust. So this is significantly more thrust. And when you think about rockets, the efficiency is everything. The amount of thrust that you could provide compared to the fuel on board is the key for you being able to get to space, be able to lift heavier payloads, and to give you more margin for error if any of the engines go offline, which we saw a bunch of them do. Another really interesting thing Thing about this story is that the engine fired for over a minute, which was quite surprising to Elon Musk, apparently, that right out of the gate, they were able to test this engine for such a long period of time. So I'm not sure when these V3 engines will be incorporated into the Super Heavy Starship stack, but it's a great initial test. Then hopefully over time, we'll see this next version make its way into the production lines and become the primary engine that are used for the Super Heavy Starship stack. I hope you're enjoying this video so far. And maybe you've noticed that we don't have some kind of sponsorship for some sort of VPN or food service or any of that. And as well, we have the bare minimum of ads on this video that YouTube allows us. And that's because of the sponsorship by our patrons. They allow us to do the work that we do, whether it's the journalism here on the YouTube channel, as well as all of the writing that happens on the Universe Today website, all of our podcasts, all of the behind the scenes stuff that we do. That's all thanks to our patrons. And beyond just making an ad free experience for everybody, if you become one of our patrons, you get an even greater ad free experience of all of our content. We'll do shout outs in our videos, and I will remove all the ads from the Universe Today website for life. So if you want to join this amazing community, go to patreon.com slash universe today. Epic photos from Mars. We got an amazing new set of images from the European Space Agency's Mars Express spacecraft. This spacecraft has been at Mars for almost 20 years and has been delivering so many incredible images of the surface of the planet. And so this one, we got a place that's a little unusual. It's called Ascraeus Mons. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with Olympus Mons, but actually there are four large shield volcanoes on Mars. Olympus Mons is the big one, but Ascraeus Mons is the second largest, and it's still a sizable shield volcano. It's 480 kilometers across and 18.1 kilometers tall. So that is still like bigger than anything we have on Earth. And so in these new images, you've got these really strange, it's really hard to describe what these things look like, sort of like sandworms on dune carving out channels or something. And in fact, Scientists aren't entirely sure what causes these. It's believed that they're probably collapsed lava tubes. So in the past, when Ascraeus Mons was actively erupting, it would have had lava flowing down slopes, and then we would have a crust form above this lava, but the lava would keep flowing and then empty out these tubes. And so you'd have these big lava tubes, and then the roofs of them would collapse. And you'd have all this terrain that was collapsed down, and that's what we're looking at. And I wanted to include this story because it's the perfect example of the kind of place you would want to send your snake bot that there's no way a rover is going to be able to crawl around in there. And yet, if you could look through all this terrain, what kinds of stuff would you find on Mars? A new way to measure the expansion of the universe. I'm sure you're familiar with this idea of the crisis in cosmology that astronomers have measured the universe in one way and they got one rate of expansion of the universe, and then they measured the expansion in another way. And they found a different value and the error bars of both values don't overlap. And so this is called the crisis in cosmology. Of course, like crisis is such a bad word. It's like the amazing opportunity in cosmology, the thrilling chance to develop new physics in cosmology. But anyway, Astronomers are always looking for more ways to measure the expansion rate of the universe. And so they've got Cepheid variables in nearby galaxies, you've got measuring the redshift of galaxies, they move away, you've got type 1a supernovae, you've got measuring the cosmic microwave background radiation, and they all give different rates for the expansion of the universe. And so astronomers have developed a new way that is really cool. 
I'm sure you're familiar with this idea of gravitational lensing where you've got a foreground galaxy cluster that is lensing some background galaxy. And occasionally you get the situation where the background galaxy has a supernova go off. And then the light from that background galaxy travels and is lensed in different ways around the foreground galaxy. And so you get the same supernova show up multiple times. In one case, astronomers saw the same supernova six different times, but delayed by multiple years. And so you could see that the light was taking a longer path to go around the foreground galaxy. And that's the key. They were able to measure the expansion rate each time they saw the supernova. And they were able to then use that to calculate in a completely independent way, the expansion rate of the entire universe. And what's really great about this is it doesn't rely on any of the other methods it doesn't rely on the Cepheid variables, they don't need the type 20 supernova it doesn't rely on the cosmic microwave background. And I'm sure you're wondering, which way does it go? And it's still fairly initial, but their results seem to hold more closely to the measurement rates found in the cosmic microwave background radiation but they're still pretty big error bars. But it's an exciting new way to measure the expansion of the universe. NASA wants to build things in space. As we get more stuff in space, we're going to need more space infrastructure. So not just satellites flying in space, but think about ways to refuel the satellites ways to boost their orbits ways to repair and refurbish them while they're in space as well as ways to manufacture parts of spacecraft in space, you don't have to like, build a very sensitive, fragile antenna on the ground, have it fold up inside a fairing, fly it to space, have it unfold, why not just build the thing in space. And so NASA has been considering a lot of these ideas. So they've pulled together a consortium of industry research space agencies to develop methods of assembly and manufacturing in space. And I'm so excited. Like I have been talking about this idea for years and years and years. And every time I hear of another cool idea to either build or assemble like a space telescope, in space, I'm all over it. And so it's great to see that now there is a whole group at NASA working to coordinate these kinds of activities. And it feels to me like this is really the future that you're going to see the largest space telescopes be built in space kind of in the same way that the International Space Station was built in space. Imagine a telescope that is much larger than JWST, but the various parts were flown to space and then assembled together. So we've got a couple of examples that are already working like made in space has a 3d printer on board the International Space Station, they've prototyped ideas to build trusses and various parts of instruments in space 3d printed. You've got the mission robotic vehicle from Northrop Grumman that can try to refuel and do servicing to satellites in space. And there's another new idea that I just found out about yesterday, that would potentially resurrect the Spitzer Space Telescope, fly out to Spitzer, put it back into a better orbit, restore some of its functionality and bring it back online. You know, it's one of the greatest telescopes that humanity has ever built. And one spacecraft could go and bring it back online, or think about boosting the Hubble Space Telescope to a higher orbit and let it go on for decades more. So there's a lot of opportunity in space based manufacturing, assembly, repair, all these ideas, and they all come together in this one consortium. So I'll let you know how this all works out. Those are all the news stories that we had today. If you want to do a deeper dive into any of them, you can find out more in the show notes down below. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at university.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to just Paul Davis, Vlad Shipelin, Jay Dennis, David Giltonen, Modso, George, 
Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbeoff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, that was all the news for today. We'll see you next week.